It's late at night. Maybe you're sleeping. It's raining outside. But you start to hear something out in the distance. Or maybe you're at work and you're miles from home. It's pouring outside. And now all of a sudden, you hear this. What do you do? Do you enjoy the storm? Do you panic because now you're worried that lightning might strike and it might destroy your entire receiving setup or maybe your ham station or whatever it is you have at home? Listen, we're going to go through it today, make it real nice and easy for you on how to protect your antenna line from lightning damage. Coming up right now on Scanner School. Welcome to the Scanner School a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. What's up, everybody? My name is Phil Lichtenberger. My amateur radio call sign is W2LIE, and welcome to Scanner School. This is a podcast where we teach you everything that you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. So if you are new to Scanner School, I want to say welcome to the podcast. Now, if you've been here before and you haven't done so yet, do me a favor. Take that device out of your pocket right now. Or if you're sitting in front of the computer, do me a favor. Subscribe to this podcast so we can send you our next week's podcast directly to your device or to your feed automatically so you never miss another episode. So again, go to scannerschool.com slash subscribe and pick your delivery content, delivery method of choice or if you're listening right now on an iPhone and you're not a subscriber, click the subscribe button and it will deliver next week's podcast right to your iPhone. Hopefully that intro wasn't a bit dramatic for you, but I wanted to play it up a little bit because it can bring a little panic to you. If you realize that, you know, it's the summertime, storms are rolling through, maybe you've got a couple antennas outside and you just put them together really quick and a kind of set it and forget it type of situation here, right? Where I'll worry about that tomorrow. What happens when tomorrow comes and there's a lightning strike in your immediate area and you lose your entire, maybe your receiving setup or maybe your whole amateur radio setup or maybe even more than that? Yeah, it could be time to panic. And really, you know, maybe this was preventable. Before we get into that, though, let's just back up one second and say, Thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. For anybody who missed last week's podcast, we had a great interview with Jonathan Higgins from Scanner Master. Now, if you don't already know, I am an affiliate with Scanner Master, and I brought Jonathan on last week to kind of show you why I've been a customer of Scanner Masters for the last 20 years. I really do in um, I really do recommend what they sell. I've worked closely with them uh, for other things that I've gone through in the past as far as other websites. They've been more than helpful uh, on those levels. And speaking with Jonathan more recently about um, you know getting him on the show and, and everything else, it's a really great company to work for uh, or work with when making a purchase. And if you are interested in making a new scanner purchase or a new accessory or anything that we've been dealing with in the last series as far as antennas and coax and today the lightning arresters, uh, next week, we talk about uh, multi-couplers. You can buy everything right through Scanner Master. So if you go to scannerschool.com slash scanner master, that is our affiliate link where you would actually allow us to collect a commission on anything you buy from Scanner Master. It comes at no additional cost for you. It's a great way to help support Scanner School, the podcast, our YouTube channel, and everything else it is that we do here. Now, there's one thing that is really cool that Scanner Master did extend to the Scanner School audience. is free shipping if you spend $200 or more. So when you check out, use coupon code SCANNERSCHOOL, with the number 7, to receive free shipping on $200 or more. And don't forget, too, today is the last day for our win a $100 gift card to Scanner Master. And again, this is my own money. I put up $100 so that um, I can help you guys either improve, update, or maybe put together your very first scanner radio setup. So in order to qualify, go to scannerschool.com slash contest. Now, again, today's the last day, the day that this airs. The announcement for the winner will be August 1st, 2018. So if you're listening to this in the future... That date might have already passed. Okay, one last announcement before we move forward is I want to remind everybody that this session and this podcast is sponsored by East Coast 
Pagers. Now, East Coast Pagers is one of my web properties. And East Coast Pagers is a Unication, Apollo, and Swiss phone dealer serving the North America market. We offer conventional voice two-tone P25 pagers, as well as the older Pogsag Flex type of pagers as well. So if you're looking for any pager accessories or a new pager for your department, contact us at East Coast Pagers and we can work on a custom quote to suit your needs. So in order to reach us, go to eastcoastpagers.com. Again, eastcoastpagers.com. And if you're looking to make a purchase on a G1, G4, or G5 pager just for yourself and not for a department, if you go to eastcoastpagers.com slash scanner school, there will be a nice little bonus for you in your checkout. So again, eastcoastpagers.com slash scanner school. All right, so let's talk about lightning arresters. Lightning arresters will probably not save anything if you hit a direct hit. I mean... Lightning is going to destroy whatever it touches. So if you take a direct hit, and I've seen uh, plenty of YouTube videos and whatnot where people's antennas have taken a direct hit. The antenna has been vaporized. Coax, you can see where the lightning jumped out of the coax. You can see where things have arced. So when lightning strikes, you know, it can be pretty catastrophic. But you can limit your losses if you have everything set up the right way. Now, again, this is no guarantee that this is going to eliminate something. I don't want anybody knocking on my door and saying, hey, you told me if we put a lightning arrest there that if I took a hit of lightning, then it's not the way that this here works. Lightning is going to find a way to ground or for some other people to earth. And that's going to uh, it's going to happen one way or another. Now, I, I bring up earth because I used to work with a uh, with somebody at my previous job and he was Jamaican and we were going around uh, grounding a bunch of paging transmitter sites. I used to work for a uh, one of the nation's largest paging sites as a field tech many years ago. And uh, we had this guy that worked for us. Like I said, he was Jamaican. So there was kind of a difference between, you know, terminologies when it came to things, not to mention, you know, there's Jamaican accents, which sometimes made you have to say, come again, you know, a couple of times before you uh, understood what he was saying. But while we were going through, we were grounding the stations. And I said, Earl, you got to go and you got to put this on ground. He goes, oh, you got to earth it, man. You got to send it to earth. And I'm like, what's earth? And he was saying that he had to ground the station when he had to earth the station. So for everybody who's listening outside the United States, if you say earth, then yes, we're talking about grounding your station to earth. So let's go through this. A lightning arrestor. What are they? A lightning arrestor is a great way to attempt to protect your transmission line from the damage that lightning causes. When I say transmission line, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about coax and everything that's attached to the coax. Um, basically, the lightning arrestor is going to protect everything downstream from the coax. So your antenna, uh, anything that's above the lightning arrestor is going to be fair game in a lightning strike. But everything beyond the lightning arrestor should be protected. So how do they work? Well, in its simplest form, what ends up happening is when the current travels down your coax, it goes through the lightning arrestor, and the amount of current that's in there is strong enough to cause a reaction where it, it shorts out, and you have a straight to ground or a straight to earth. And there's two main types of lightning arresters. You can have a spark cap or a gas cap, which basically has a gas mixture inside, which ionizes when there's enough voltage across it. Or you can have a thyrite, which is basically a trade name for a semiconductor, which does the exact same thing. When it reaches a certain level, it shorts out right to ground. So again, once it shorts out now, you're done in the water as far as using that lightning arrestor, unless you have one with a gas cap or a spark cap. You can actually unscrew the, the spark cap and put in a new one, which kind of saves you from dealing with having to pull out the weather stripping and everything else. But again, too, that may be the least of your problem if everything upstream from that coax is destroyed. So you may find out that your antenna is no longer there. You may find out that the coax is burnt to a crisp. So if you take apart the end connector or the PL259, whatever it is that you're using on the antenna side, you may find out is no longer inside there anymore. You may find that the shield of the coax maybe has puncture holes in it, is burnt. You can see the shield through the insulator on the uh, insulator jacket of the coax as well. 
Lots of things can get destroyed when it comes to lightning. So how do we protect everything beyond the antenna? Where does the lightning arrestor go? Well, there's two different flavors of lightning arresters that are pretty common in the RF environment. One of them is one where you strip the, the insulator jacket off the coax and you slide the lightning uh, diverter on it, I guess you could say. It crimps down and that little pigtail then goes to ground via a ground rod. The easier, the simplest way, and what I under, what I kind of feel is for, for us, for scanner listeners, probably the more um, the simplest way to set it up is by using a traditional inline lightning arrestor, which basically has coax connectors on it, whether it be F, PL259, or N, and it's a little box that sits between the coax, which is really a simple way to do it. So what you would do is you would bring your coax line down from the antenna. It would plug into the lightning arrestor, and then another coax line continues then into your house. And that's the key here. It's before it goes in the house. You want to divert the lightning before it enters your building. Now, you can play it safe, and you can ground everything once it's inside the house, but why bring lightning in if you don't have to? So what I like to do is... Maybe you build yourself an all-weather enclosure. You can buy those at your local weekend warrior stores like Lowe's or Home Depot, Ace True Value, whatever it is that you have in your neck of the woods. And you can mount the lightning arresters inside of the outdoor box. But what do you want to look for when you are buying a lightning arrestor? Well, first thing you want to look at is the connectors. We just touched on that, F, PL259, N. What connectors are you using right now on your coax? Well, if you're looking at some prepackaged LMR 400, which is, again, what I recommend, and if you want to go back and listen to the coax session, you can go back to scannerschool.com slash session 30. That's where we talked about the different types of coaxial cable. But going back to what we're talking about here with lightning arresters, you need to know what it is that's on the end of the coax cable that you're using. Again, pre-made LMR 400 cable typically has N connectors and more typically has an N male connector on there. So you want to make sure that you have N female connectors on your lightning arrestor. Typically, you're going to use N female to N female on the lightning arrestor. So you can run two pre-made LMR 400 cables into and out of the lightning arrestor. Or maybe you're just going to go into a bulkhead connector. Maybe That's what I have on the side of my house. I just have really long bulkhead connectors that go through the, um, the, that go through the exterior wall of my house. And I could really use an end female to an end male, but I choose not to. I choose to mount my lightning arresters as soon as my coax goes horizontal. So again, you want to look at the proper uh, connectors that are on the lightning arrestor. The next thing you want to look at, too, is the frequency band. You want to make sure that the frequency pass is okay for what you're using it for. A lot of times you can find DC to, to uh, gigahertz. Maybe you can only find some that are VHF, UHF. Now, again, for receiving, I'm not sure if they'll work for you, but there are some values on there for uh, voltages and frequencies. But it's not too hard to find some that are wide, wide band for us who are scanner radio listeners. Now, if you have a tower-mounted amplifier or a preamp that's mounted underneath your antenna, you're going to want to look for a lightning arrestor that passes DC voltage. Now, it's important because you need to figure out a way somehow to power up your preamplifier. And if you're powering up via the coax using a bias T, then yes, you need to have a lightning arrestor that does pass DC voltage. Now, again, the other thing you want to look at, too, the final thing really is the signal loss. How much loss in dB is putting a lightning arrestor going to be on your total receive station? Typically, it's less than half a dB, and again, that's on the higher frequencies. But again, that will all be on the spec sheet on the lightning arrestor that you're looking at. So let's talk about physically grounding everything on the exterior of your house. And we're going to talk about the interior grounding on a future podcast. But for right now, I just want to stick to the location that we are on the coax. So what you're going to want to do is you'll bring the coax down from the antenna. You'll bring it into the lightning arrestor. The lightning arrestor needs to be grounded. So what you're going to do is you'll sink a copper lightning rod in the ground 
at that point or somewhere near that point. Now, again, Lightning is going to take the path of least resistance. So give it a place to get to ground as soon as possible. From this lightning rod, now again, you may want to look at your local code to find out how far down you have to go. In my neck of the woods here, 8 feet is enough. But if you have extremely sandy soil or something else, you need to get down to proper earth or proper ground, you might need maybe 10 feet, 12 feet, 16 feet. It may depend on where you are, so check your local building regulations as to how far down a grounding rod must be in order to be effective. Now again, you're going to sink a copper grounding rod into ground. You'll want to connect your lightning arrestor using some really heavy gauge copper uh, ground rod. And there'll be a ground screw on the lightning arrestor itself. Do a good job at either putting the lightning arrestor in a weather tight box or wrap that lightning arrestor up so that no moisture gets in there. You don't want water in any of your coax or in the lightning arrestor itself. Also, take this opportunity to ground your antenna mast. You can get real cheap aluminum grounding rod. It's really thin uh, grounding, wa grounding wire. It's solid wire, and you'll run that from the antenna mast down to the same lightning rod that you put in the ground or the ground rod. Check the manual for your antenna. Most antennas do not require a direct ground. It's going to get ground through the mast anyway, but some antennas may say it needs to be properly grounded. I know with my HF antenna, there's a ground lug on there, and I should be attaching that to ground as well. I said should be. Doesn't mean I had done it. Practice as I preach, not as I do. All right? I, I do not completely have my setup the way I want it here as well. I am guilty of not following my own advice, which is why I'm pretty much very up on this right now because I am taking the opportunity to go back through my entire setup as I go through this whole uh, tutorial here down the coax and going through all the mistakes that I've made years ago and also some things that maybe I just did a little too quick and need to go back and correct. Okay, so you've got your mass grounded, you've got your lightning arrestor grounded, okay, and... Anything else outside that's this grounded. Maybe you're close enough to the ground rod for the electrical panel and you want to tie or bond those uh, ground rods together. Go for it. All right. So you've now got everything outside grounded. What about on the inside? Like I said, we'll talk about inside grounding later on in a future podcast because we can go on another 20 minutes just on the internal stuff. So let's talk about lightning arresters themselves as far as a company goes or what it is I recommend. I've been using Alpha Delta lightning arresters at my location here. So I have four antennas up. Three of them are grounded right now using Alpha Delta lightning arresters. I like the Alpha Delta brand uh, basically because it's one of the first lightning arresters that somebody gave me when I was putting my station together. So that's one reason why I went with Alpha Delta. The second reason why I went with Alpha Delta is because they do use the spar cap or the gas cap type of diversion. So if I ever did get a lightning strike here that was close enough to short out my lightning arresters, all I would have to do is just remove the gas cap, the spark gap, put in a new one, reground it, and hopefully I'm good to go. But again, I could end up having to replace coax or antennas anyway, but it won't be ruining anything that's downstream from there. Uh, there's other ones out there too that do not have the spark cap or the gas cap. And in that situation, you would just have to replace the entire lightning arrestor. Another trade name that's very popular is Polyphaser. And Polyphaser is a commercial brand as well, and they are one that I would also recommend. Now, I don't have any affiliates here for Polyphaser or Alpha Delta at the time I'm recording this. Amazon does have a couple, and I'll put a couple links in the show notes here, but... I was looking at the Alpha Deltas that they have and the frequency ranges for VHF and above, and I wanted something that would do low band as well. So that's not one that I'll be recommending. But these, there are Alpha Deltas out there that have a wide, a, a DC, basically zero to a gigahertz of coverage as well. So that's our short story on lightning arresters and why they are important and why everybody, including me, should have them set up at their station right now. 
All right, so what if you don't have a lightning arrestor, or maybe you do, but you're looking for that extra mile or extra step that you can do to kind of protect yourself from lightning? Well, there's two other methods here that we didn't get in to talk about earlier. One would be use an AB switch for your antenna. And a lot of those have a neutral position that go straight to ground. I use Alpha Delta AB switches and Alpha Delta four port switches and there's a position in the switch that will take you straight to ground and these switches also have the alpha delta gas plug or the arc plug in the switch themselves uh, the other best method really to do is just unplug your cable line unplug the coax from the back of your scanner or before it hits the multi-coupler or right where you can as soon as it comes in the house take that coax unscrew it from the bulkhead connector or wherever it is that you can unscrew it from and just let it be while you're not using the scanner and that is another great way to protect your equipment from lightning all right so if you've been listening to the last few weeks of the podcast you're probably expecting that little catchy jingle to come on here and talk about the promotion that we're having right now for the hundred dollars scanner master gift card I'm going to skip that this week because there's only a couple hours left on that. So, again, go to scannerschool.com slash contest for your chance to win a $100 gift card. It's not too late until the clock strikes midnight going into August 1st, 2018. So if you're listening to this on the last day of the contest, please get on there. Scannerschool.com slash contest and make sure that you submit your information in order to win a $100 gift card to Scanner Master from me to you. All right, guys. So next week, we're going to talk about some of the inside stuff when it comes to setting up your station. We're going to talk about multi-couplers. A lot of you have been asking me about multi-couplers, and the time has finally come to talk about it. So until next week, I want to remind everybody, you can follow us on Facebook, scannerschool.com slash Facebook. Join our Facebook community. It's growing. We have a lot of people in there, a lot of activity, a lot of daily conversation going on in there. Scannerschool.com slash Facebook group is the place to be. I am heavy on Twitter at Scannerschool.com slash Twitter. I am building my YouTube channel. I've got a couple of SDS 100 videos. In fact, I still have the SDS 100 in my white box right now with a couple of accessories sitting next to it. That will be a upcoming YouTube video. So scannerschool.com slash YouTube. And I'm on Instagram now. Take a look behind the show. See what's going on in my personal life. Scannerschool.com slash Instagram. Before we go today, I just want to take a moment to thank our Patreon supporters. We have M.T. Bono, Kenneth Fowler, and Mark Beebe. I want to thank our Patreon supporters for their continued support of the Scanner School podcast and everything it is that we do here at Scanner School. So what exactly is or are our Patreon supporters? It's kind of like the PBS model. They've pledged a certain amount of money to us monthly to help support and keep us going. If that is not something that you're interested in, but you still want to help us out, go to scannerschool.com slash support. In there, we have links to our Amazon account or um, affiliates. You can uh, give us a one-time PayPal donation, or you can find other ways that you can help support the Scanner School project, and some of them come at no cost to you. I also want to remind you all that there is a resource page that is growing on Scanner School. Now, everything we've been talking about over the last few weeks from the antenna to the coax line, uh, the uh, lightning protection next week with the multi-couplers, and everything that we talk about on the series is going to be in our resources page. So it's a one-stop place for you to go and get an overview of everything that it is that we've been talking about recently. So go to scannerschool.com slash resources. And again, there's a link at the very top of the homepage where you can go and get a direct link over to our resources page. It's a great location to find out what it is we re recommend for home antennas, mobile antennas, uh, back of or top of unit set antennas. Again, the lightning arresting, the coax and everything else that it takes to build a scanner setup. All right. And also, while you're there, make sure you go and sign up for our newsletter. Scannerschool.com is our homepage. And again, you can find all of the session notes for this podcast at scannerschool.com slash session 32.
All right, guys, if you haven't subscribed to us already, make sure you do so, and we'll catch you all next week. My name is Phil Lichtenberger. I want to thank you so much for joining us again on Scanner School, where we teach you everything that you need to know about the Scanner Radio Hobby 73. Thanks for listening to the Scanner School podcast. Be sure to visit www.scannerschool.com to access the show notes and bonus content.